Mike, today we're talking Fed, talk a little bit of China and EMs, and then we'll get into U.S. election outcomes. Hello and welcome to the Outlook by Capstrat. Let's start with the Fed. Uh, we can revisit our three different landing scenarios. Maybe we start with what are the probabilities we're assigning to these different scenarios and where are those probabilities come from? So in September, the Fed cut a half a percent starting their rate cutting cycle. We thought that was more than was necessary. Um, but the good news is if the Fed's willing to cut a half a percent in the absence of a full-blown layoff cycle or a market crisis, that's good news in terms of reducing the probability of a, of a recession. So as a result, we've taken our hard landing or recession probability down from 20% to 10%. Um, the market is right now pricing in something like this immaculate landing which, you know, the purple line here, pretty methodical rate cuts at every meeting from now through mid-2025, ending at something near 3%, which the Fed believes is the neutral rate right. of interest. Um, now, 30% chance, if you look back at the historical record, 149 rate cutting cy cycles in advanced economies, 25 of them are inflation abating rate cutting cycles, which is what we're talking about here. Inflation is abating, so the Fed is cutting. Only five of those 25 have ended in a soft or immaculate landing. So that's obviously 20% historical probability. We give the Fed the benefit of the doubt, say 30% chance, which leaves 60% chance in the no landing. Now, the no landing looks similar to the immaculate landing at the onset, but the good news in this scenario is the economy reacts very positively to these initial rate cuts pick up in hiring, pick up in economic growth, pick up in investment. And as a result, the Fed sort of stops short and pauses because hopefully not, but perhaps with that pickup in economic growth, inflation doesn't come back down to 2% as quickly as they would like. Yep. Um, and so that we think is, is the highest probability event. It pans out historically, is more similar to what happened in the mid-1990s as well. Yeah, that, that's the tough part about the immaculate landing is you need that economic data to continue improving, but you keep getting cuts from the Fed. And, and yeah. to our point with the no landing being the base case, a couple of reasons for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one being, well, overall, this is just a great environment to start a rate cut cycle into. One being the consumer balance sheet, household debt service ratio at, at incredibly low levels, and two being cash on the sidelines. Exactly. Can households have the capacity to take on more debt? as long as the price tag on that debt comes down. So that's what interest rate cuts are all about. So that's a great starting point. And then also money market fund assets as a percent of GDP, almost 27% of real GDP. As yields on those money market funds come down, a lot of that cash is going to be redeployed in other investment opportunities or the real economy. And so you look at this setup and you think, economic activity likely to improve here while the Fed is cutting rates, we think that's pretty positive for areas of the equity market that are that need the rate cuts, yep. think small caps, and need a pickup in economic growth, think value stocks. Um, and so we think that's a pretty positive outlook there, at least until end of Q1 next year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on the U.S. side, we get the 50 basis point cut from the Fed. Jay Powell comes out and says a couple of weeks later they don't feel like they're in a hurry. Uh, we go to the other side of the spectrum and we look at a monetary and fiscal authority that does appear to be in a hurry, particularly mm -hmm. in China. Um, EM is another area of it within our investment framework that have looked pretty attractive for some time. What, what's the story in China and how could that affect EMs elsewhere? Yeah. China, has, it's been a straight line down into the right since 2021. The, the Chinese yuan has weakened pretty consistently versus the U.S. dollar as a result of a number of failed policies, a property crisis, and then also the fact that the Fed has kept interest rates very high for very long, which has sucked money out of not only China, but other countries around the world and into dollars. And during that time period, the MSCI China stock index has underperformed the rest of the world by almost 80%. Um, so a number of emerging markets have been dealing with pressures, not to the extent of China, but China is the largest emerging market. So why are we showing this chart now? Well, as you said, a little over a week ago, the People's Bank of China rolled out in dramatic fashion way more stimulus measures than they had previously during this crisis. 
you know, some of the most significant monetary stimulus we've seen since the global yeah. financial crisis. They made it very public. They actually took questions during the press conference, if you can believe it. And it was followed up with uh, hints at fiscal stimulus. Now, the, China, the People's Republic of China has enacted fiscal stimulus at various points, but it was all focused on the supply side. And this seems to be more targeted at consumers, which need the help. So this time is different. The market has reacted differently. If you look at a basket of stocks on the Shanghai exchange, they're up about 25% in five or six days going yeah. right into their holiday week. So the market thinks this is different. Um, we say not so fast. There was plenty of short covering here. You have a long conditioning period of everybody disliking Chinese stocks. This could be a knee-jerk reaction. And we know this kind of seems like pushing on a string. China is dealing with the bursting of a property bubble yep. that is sizes of which we've probably never seen. And it could take decades to work off the housing oversupply and the damage to consumer balance sheets. So you don't want to get too excited about China in particular at this point. But what would be helpful is, as the Fed cuts rates, China and other emerging markets can feel comfortable cutting rates and enacting their own stimulus without the fear of currency flight. Yeah. That is meaningful, the knock-on effects of that. If the Fed continues to cut, that's going to provide tremendous breathing room for other EMs, other emerging markets around the world to stimulate their economies. That could be something that would look, you know, emerging markets in our framework are cheap for sure. That could be something that could turn into a catalyst on the macro side and say now they're cheap with an improving macro environment. That might be something tradable. So that's something we're watching very closely. Yeah. 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 So you, you talked about this potential breathing room for emerging markets. We talked about how we're getting excited about the economically sensitive areas of the market on the U.S. side. Let's talk about a couple of things that could potentially throw that outlook off. Mm -hmm. The first of which being recession. If we check in on our recession signal, still not active, still kind of backing up from the brink we saw in early mid-August, but clearly not out of the woods. Still yep. seeing some yellow across the board here. Yep. Sequentially, we've seen stabilization of the initial jobless claims data. We've talked about how we follow that over the unemployment rate, over the non-farm payrolls report, but it's clear the market needs to see sequential improvement in those big ticket data releases around the labor market, the non-farm payrolls report, yep. um, the unemployment rate. They need to see that, and we think rate cuts are going to be that catalyst. Um, so as that starts to happen, that'll be sort of the sweet spot for those areas of the market that we think look, look more attractive. And if the data goes the other way, we'll change our minds. Yep. So <laughs> that'll, that'll just cut some more. Yep. Uh, the, the other area we're thinking about are U.S. election outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And, and from a market perspective, looking for a relatively benign outcome. Uh, of course, that's going to start with the presidential election. And I think the most important thing here is we're not seeing the market lean too far one way or another. You can see based on our different factors here, some red, some blue. And, and most importantly, perhaps the poll, state polling numbers very, very close. Yeah, at this point, you really start to focus in on what truly matters, which is the tipping point state. That swing state that's most likely to decide the election outcome. In recent weeks, that's been Pennsylvania, and the polling data there is so close you cannot call it. So unless something dramatically changes between now and election night, it's anyone's race in terms of Trump or Harris. Yep. And of course, it's not just about the presidential election, it's about the two houses of Congress as well. Um, so what we're looking at here are the, the rolling probability of democratic control of the different areas of government, looking at various sources, predictive, betting odds, markets. Um, but from our perspective, from a market standpoint, really the least benign outcome yeah. would be a Republican presidency, a Donald Trump presidency with a split Congress or, yep. or anything besides a Republican controlled Congress. Yep. Yep, yep. Republican president without a sweep, without a Republican yep. sweep. And the reason for that is Donald Trump on his own without congressional support can do the things the market doesn't like. Most importantly, tariffs. Yep. And then secondly, reducing immigration. Market would not be a fan of those policies. And without the congressional support, he would lack the unity required to do the things the market would like, which would be extension of tax cuts, additional tax cuts, so on and so forth. So when we think about election outcomes, that's really the only one 
yep. that the markets would not take in stride. So what are these probabilities looking like? We'll start down here with the Senate. That looks, betting odds are on that the Senate is going to flip Republican. If you just look at the seats that are up for, that are up for re-election and where they fall, that's been a pretty solid bet in different betting markets and polling data. Um, so you're looking at perhaps a split Congress. And then on the other side, you look at the House data. That's been firmly in Democrat control since about July. Yep. But it's important to note because the majority of the House seats are up for re-election and there's a lot of historical variability there, nobody has a lot of confidence in that data. That's what people are betting on, but we would take that with a grain of salt. So that could go either way. And then finally, we just talked about how in the presidency, it could, it's anyone's race. So if you were to just look at this chart, you would say Kamala Harris is the president and you have a split Congress. That would be very benign. That would be kind of business as usual, mild fiscal stimulus, but nothing too rampant and no, no concern about tariffs or tightening immigration too much too soon that would reduce labor supply. So the market would take that in stride, but there isn't a huge difference between that and Republican president with a split Congress. Yep. So that's why, you know, it's going to be a nail biter. Unless things change between now and then, it's going to be a nail biter on election night. And that's why when you look back at, when you look out at how markets are preparing for this, they're preparing for anything. And we think that's very healthy. Yeah. It would be where you get volatility is when everybody prepares for one outcome and it doesn't happen. That's not happening this time around. Everybody's preparing for anything. Yep. Yeah. Something to, uh, something to look forward to. Yep. And that will do it for this edition of the Outlook by Capstrat. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out.